Chapter 10 The Unity of the Universe Oh, my soul, I hope there will come a time when you will be good, straightforward, singular, more transparent and visible than the body that encloses you. You will one day realize the joy of those whose goal is love and whose desires are detached from all worldly things. You will one day be satisfied, not needing anything external, not seeking pleasure from anything this world can offer, be it living or non-living. You won't need time to continue your pleasure, nor place and opportunity, nor the favor of the weather or people. When you are content in your current state, and everything present adds to your contentment, when you convince yourself that you have everything, all for your good, and all by the providence of the gods. You will also be confident about the future, believing that everything will go well, contributing in some way to the maintenance and preservation of perfect well-being and happiness. Such will be your disposition one day, that you'll be able to interact with both gods and men in such a way that you never complain about them for anything they do, nor do anything for which you could be justly condemned. As one governed entirely by nature, make it your duty to observe what your nature generally requires. Once done, if you find that your nature, as a living, sensible creature, won't be harmed by it, you may proceed. Next, you must examine what your nature as a living, sensible creature requires. And that, whatever it may be, you may accept and do it, if your nature as a reasonable living creature won't be harmed by it. Whatever is reasonable is also sociable. Stick to these rules and don't bother yourself with trivial matters. Whatever happens to you, you are naturally either able or unable to bear it. If you're able, don't be upset, but bear it according to your nature, or as nature has enabled you. If you're not able, don't be upset. For it will soon end you, and itself, ending with you at the same time. But remember, whatever you can tolerate through the strength of opinion, based on a certain understanding of both true profit and duty, you can bear through your natural constitution. Teach the person who offends you with love and gentleness, and show him his mistake. But if you can't, then blame yourself, or rather, don't blame yourself either, if your will and efforts haven't been lacking. Whatever happens to you is what was destined for you all the time. For by the same sequence of causes, by which your substance was destined to exist from all eternity, was also whatever should happen to it, destined, and appointed. We must either foolishly believe with Epicurus that atoms are the cause of all things, or we must accept nature. Let your first principle be that you are part of the universe, which is governed by nature. Then secondly, that you have a relationship of kinship with those parts that are of the same kind and nature as you are. If you keep this in mind, first as a part, you will never be upset with anything that is your share of the world's common chances. For nothing that is beneficial to the whole can truly harm a part of it. So, remembering that I am part of such a universe, I won't be upset with anything that happens. And since I have a kinship with those parts that are of the same kind and nature as I am, I will be careful not to do anything harmful to the community, but in all my decisions, I will always consider the common good. Once you've made these decisions and commitments, you might think you'd be a content citizen, constantly working for the good of your fellow citizens, and the city reciprocating that goodwill, leading you to live a happy life. Everything in the world, I mean everything contained within the world, must inevitably decay, or change at some point. I use the word decay for simplicity, but the more accurate word is change. If this inevitable change is harmful yet unavoidable, wouldn't it be troubling for the whole universe, given that all its parts are subject to change and decay, being made of different and opposing elements? Did nature intentionally design its parts to suffer and be miserable, or did it not know what it was doing when it created them? Both these propositions seem absurd. But let's look at individual things according to their own nature. It's absurd to say that all parts of the universe are naturally subject to change, and then be surprised and upset when change happens, like when someone falls ill and dies. It might be less distressing if we remember that when something breaks down, it breaks down into the elements it was made of. This breakdown is either a dispersion of the elements back into their original form, or a transformation of solid matter into earth and spirit into air. So, nothing is lost, but everything is returned to the rational seeds of the universe. 
The universe will either be consumed by fire after a certain time or continually change and renew, enduring forever. The solid and spiritual elements we speak of aren't the same as when you were born. Your current form, both in substance and life, comes from food you've eaten and air you've breathed in the past few days, making you no different than a river sustained by a constant flow of water. What you've received since birth, not what you inherited from your mother, is what changes and decays. Even if the solid substance sticks with you, what about its qualities and characteristics, which are certainly different? Now that you've taken on the qualities of being good, modest, and truthful, be careful not to lose these qualities by acting contrary to them. If you do, return to them as quickly as possible. Remember, being mindful means considering every object that comes your way without distraction. Being content means readily accepting whatever nature brings you. Being transcendent means going beyond physical pain and pleasure, honor and disgrace, death, and anything similar, seeing them as irrelevant to a wise person. If you can maintain these qualities without seeking recognition from others, you'll become a new person and start a new life. To continue as you've been, experiencing the same stresses and discomforts would be foolish. It would be like a gladiator, covered in wounds and blood, asking to be spared until the next day to face the same dangers. So, move on from your troubled past and commit to these few qualities. If you can stay true to them, you'll be as happy as if you've been transported to a place of bliss and happiness, like the islands of the blessed or the Elysian fields, as described by Hesiod and Plato. If you find yourself slipping, retreat to a quiet corner where you can regain your composure. If that doesn't work, it's better to give up your life. So that you may not be swept away by emotion, but rather approach this in a calm, humble manner, this being the most commendable action of your life, that you have left in this way, or this having been the main work and goal of your life, that you might leave in this way. Now, for the better remembrance of those names that we have mentioned, you will find it very beneficial to remember the gods as often as possible, and what they require from us, as rational beings is not that we flatter them with eloquent words and outward displays of piety and devotion, but rather that we should strive to be like them, and just as all other natural creatures, such as the fig tree, the dog, the bee, all do what is natural and proper to them according to their nature, so too. Should humans do what is natural and proper to them as humans? Your daily life is filled with trivialities and foolishness at home, wars abroad, sometimes fear, sometimes lethargy or dull laziness, this is your daily servitude. Little by little, if you don't pay better attention, those sacred principles will be erased from your mind. How many things are there, which when you have simply considered them from a naturalistic perspective, you let pass without any further use? Whereas you should in all things combine action and contemplation, so that you might both attend to all present occasions, to perform everything dutifully and carefully, and yet also focus on the contemplative aspect, so that no part of the delight and pleasure, which the contemplative knowledge of everything according to its true nature provides, might be lost. Or, that the true and contemplative knowledge of everything according to its own nature, might in itself, action being subject to many obstacles and impediments, provide you with sufficient pleasure and happiness. Not obvious indeed, but not hidden. And when will you achieve the happiness of true simplicity and unaffected seriousness? When will you rejoice in the certain knowledge of every specific object according to its true nature, as what its matter and substance is, what its use is in the world, how long it can exist, what things it consists of, who can have it, and who can give it, and take it away? As the spider, when it has caught the fly that it hunted, is not a little proud, nor modestly self-satisfied, as he likewise who has caught a hare, or has caught a fish with his net, as another for the capture of a boar, and another of a bear, so may they be proud, and congratulate themselves for their valiant acts against the Sarmatai, or the recently defeated northern nations. For these also, these famous soldiers and warlike men, if you investigate their minds and beliefs, what do they mostly do but hunt for prey? To discover and set for yourself some certain way and method of contemplation, whereby you may clearly discern and represent to yourself the mutual transformation of all things, one into another. Keep this in your mind always and ensure that you are thoroughly well practiced in this. 
For there is nothing more effective than to cultivate true greatness of spirit. He has freed himself from the bonds of his body, and realizing that very soon he must inevitably bid the world farewell, and leave all these things behind him, he entirely devoted himself, as to righteousness in all his actions, so to the common nature in all things that should happen to him. And being content with these two things, to do everything justly, and to like well whatever God sends, what others shall either say or think of him, or shall do against him, he does not even trouble his thoughts with it. To go on straight, where right and reason directed him, and by so doing to follow God, was the only thing that he minded, that, his only business and occupation. What use is there for suspicion at all? Or why should thoughts of mistrust, and suspicion, concerning the future, trouble your mind at all? What now needs to be done, if you may research and inquire into that, what more do you need to care for? And if you are well able to understand it alone, let no man divert you from it. But if alone you do not understand it well, suspend your action, and seek advice from the best. And if there is anything else that hinders you, proceed with caution and discretion, according to the current situation and opportunity, always proposing to yourself what you conceive to be most right and just. For to achieve that correctly, and to succeed in its pursuit, must surely be happiness, since it is that only which we can truly and properly be said to miss or fail in. What is that which is slow, yet quick? Joyful, yet serious? It is he who in all things follows reason as his guide. In the morning as soon as you wake up, when your judgment, before either your emotions or external objects have influenced it, is still most free and impartial, ask yourself this question, whether if what is right and just is done, the doing of it by yourself, or by others when you are not able yourself, is a material thing or not. For surely it is not. And as for those who lead such a life, and place so much importance on the praises or criticisms of other people, have you forgotten what sort of people they are? That they behave in certain ways in their beds, and at their tables, what their ordinary actions are, what they pursue and what they avoid, what thefts and robberies they commit, if not with their hands and feet, yet with that most precious part of theirs, their minds, which, if they would only allow it, could possess faith, modesty, truth, justice, a good spirit. The well-educated and truly humble person says, give what you will, and take away what you will, to the one who gives and takes away. He doesn't say this out of stubbornness or obstinacy, but out of pure love and humble submission. Live as if you are indifferent to the world and all its objects, as if you were living alone on a deserted hill. Whether here or there, if the whole world is just like one town, the place doesn't matter much. Let people see a man who is truly a man, living according to the true nature of man. If they can't tolerate me, let them kill me. It's better to die than to live as they would want you to. Stop debating or discussing what the signs and characteristics of a good man are, but strive to be one. Always remind yourself of the general age and time of the world, and its whole substance. Understand that all things, in relation to these, are insignificant in their substance, like one of the smallest seeds, and fleeting in their duration, like a pestle turning once in a mortar. Focus your mind on every object in the world and realize that it is already in a state of dissolution and change, heading towards decay or dispersion, or whatever else constitutes the death of everything in its own kind. Consider people in all their actions and occupations, whether they are eating, sleeping, relieving themselves, or engaging in lustful acts. Consider them when they are at their most exultant, amid their glory, or when they are angry and displeased, chastising and rebuking from a lofty position. Consider how base and servile they were not long ago, and what their state will be when death seizes them. What is best for everyone is what the common nature of all sends to everyone, and it is best when it sends it. The earth, says the poet, often longs for rain. Similarly, the glorious sky often desires to fall upon the earth, indicating a mutual love between them. Likewise, the world bears a certain affection for whatever will happen. My affections will coincide with yours, O oh world. My desires will be the same as yours. It is true that the world loves, as commonly said and acknowledged. We often say that things that used to be, love to be. Either you continue in this life 
which you are accustomed to and therefore can tolerate, or you withdraw from the world, and that by your own choice, in which case you have your wish, or your life is cut short, and then you can rejoice that you have completed your duty. One of these must happen, so be comforted. Always remember that solitude and desolate places, so highly valued and sought after by many philosophers, are only as they are. All things are the same to those who live in towns and interact with others as they are to those who have retreated to mountaintops, deserted havens, or any other desolate and uninhabited places. Wherever you are, you can quickly find and apply Plato's concept of his philosopher in a secluded place, as private and secluded as if he were shut up in a shepherd's lodge on a hilltop. There, by yourself, ask these questions or consider these points. What is my main and principal part, which has power over the rest? What is its current state as I use it, and what do I use it for? Is it now devoid of reason? Is it free and separate, or so attached and hardened with the flesh that it is influenced by its movements and inclinations? The one who runs away from his master is a fugitive. But the law is everyone's master. Therefore, the one who abandons the law is a fugitive. So, is the one who is sorry, angry, or afraid, or for anything that has been, is, or will be by his appointment, who is the Lord and Governor of the universe. For he truly and properly is the law, as the only distributor and dispenser of all things that happen to anyone in his lifetime. Therefore, anyone who is sorry, angry, or afraid is a fugitive. A man provides the seed, which once implanted into the womb, he has no further involvement with. Another cause takes over, undertakes the work, and over time brings a child, that wonderful result from such a beginning, to perfection. Again, a man swallows food down his throat, and once swallowed, he has no further involvement with it. Another force takes this sustenance and distributes it into the senses and emotions, into life and strength, and performs many other incredible actions that are part of being human. You must learn to observe and contemplate these processes that occur unseen and invisibly, not just the processes themselves, but also the power by which they are carried out. You may not see it with your physical eyes, but you can understand it as clearly as you can see the cause of something rising or falling. Always remember and remind yourself how everything that exists now was once much the same as it is now and will likely be the same in the future. Also, think of the entire dramas, the lives, and actions of people in a specific profession or role that you've either experienced or read about in ancient histories. Consider the courts of Adrianus, Antoninus Pius, Philippus, Alexander, and Croesus. You'll find that they're all similar, just with different players. Imagine everyone who grieves for any worldly thing or complains about the miseries of life as a pig squealing and struggling when its throat is cut. Remember this, only rational creatures have the privilege to submit to providence willingly and freely, but absolute submission is a necessity imposed on all creatures. Whatever you're doing, ask yourself, just because I won't be able to do this when I'm dead, should death seem grievous to me? When you're upset with someone's wrongdoing, instantly reflect on yourself and consider your own faults. Perhaps you also believe that it's a blessing to be rich, or to live in pleasure, or to be praised. If you remember this, your anger will quickly fade, especially when you also consider that the person was compelled by his misunderstanding and ignorance to act as he did. If you can, try to remove the misconception that forces him to behave in such a way. When you see Satyro, think of Socraticus and Eutyx, or Hymen. When you see Euphrates, think of Eutychio and Sylvanus. When you see Alciphron, think of Tropiophorus. When you see Xenophon, think of Crito or Severus. When you look at yourself, imagine one of Caesar's. Then remind yourself, where are they all now? Nowhere or everywhere? This will remind you how all worldly things are like smoke that vanishes away, or, indeed, they are nothing. Especially when you remember that anything that once changed will never be the same again for as long as the world exists. And you, how long will you last? Why isn't it enough for you to live virtuously and appropriately for the short time you have? Why do you long to escape your life and circumstances? They're perfect subjects for an understanding that sees everything in its true nature. 
Be patient until you've made these things familiar and natural to you, like a strong stomach that turns all food into its own substance, or a great fire that turns everything thrown into it into flame and light. Don't let anyone truthfully say that you're not truly simple, honest, or good. Let anyone who thinks otherwise be mistaken. This is entirely up to you. Who can prevent you from being truly simple and good? Decide to not live at all rather than not be such a person. What can be said or done in this situation that is reasonable and wise? Whatever it is, you have the power to say or do it, so don't make excuses as if you're being prevented. You will never stop complaining until what brings joy to the indulgent brings joy to you, to do in every situation what can be done in accordance with human nature. You should consider anything you can do according to your nature as a pleasure, and you can do this anywhere. A roller, water, fire, or any other thing that is natural or sensitive but not rational, can't move everywhere according to its own nature, as many things can obstruct their operations. Consider this, the unique privilege of the mind and understanding is its ability to overcome any obstacle it encounters, moving forward according to its own will. So, focus on this strength of your mind, its ability to navigate through everything and adapt to all situations, much like fire rising upwards, a stone falling downwards, or a cylinder rolling on a slope. Be content with it and don't seek anything else. Remember, all other obstacles that don't hinder your mind are either physical or merely products of your own perception, when your reason fails to resist and cowardly succumbs. These obstacles can't harm or hurt you. Otherwise, anyone who encounters them would inevitably become worse than before. In other situations, something is considered harmful if it worsens the subject. However, in this case, a person can become better and more commendable if they handle these obstacles correctly. In general, remember that nothing can harm a citizen that doesn't harm the city itself, and nothing can harm the city that doesn't harm the law itself. But these external obstacles don't harm the law itself or go against justice and equity, which maintain public societies. Therefore, they can't harm either the city or the citizens. Just as someone bitten by a rabid dog becomes fearful of almost everything they see, so does someone bitten by dogma or imprinted with true knowledge. Almost everything they see or read, no matter how brief or ordinary, serves as a reminder to dispel their grief and fear. Consider the poet's words, the winds blow upon the trees, and their leaves fall upon the ground. Then the trees begin to bud again, and by springtime they put forth new branches. So is the generation of men, some come into the world, and others go out of it. Your children are like these leaves. Those who applaud you or your speeches, as well as those who curse you or secretly criticize and mock you, are also like leaves. Those who will follow, keeping the memory of famous men alive after their deaths, are also leaves. All these worldly things have their spring, they grow, then the wind blows, and they fall. And then others grow in their place from the common matter of all things, like them. But everything is temporary. Why then should you chase after or run away from these things as if they would last forever? In a short while, your eyes will close, and soon after, someone will mourn the person who carries you to your grave. A good eye should be able to see everything, not just pleasant things. Similarly, a good ear, a good nose, and a good stomach should be ready for whatever they hear, smell, or eat. A sound understanding should be prepared for whatever happens. But if you say, I wish my children would live, or I wish everyone would praise everything I do, you're like an eye that only wants to see pleasant things, or teeth that only want to eat soft food. No one dies without at least some of those present at their death rejoicing at their supposed misfortune. If the deceased was virtuous and wise, wouldn't there be someone who would think, finally, I can rest from this pedagogue. He didn't openly trouble us much, but I know he judged us harshly in his heart. That's what people will say about the virtuous. But for us, there are many reasons why people would be glad to be rid of us. If you keep this in mind when you die, you will die more willingly, thinking, I am leaving a world where even my closest friends and family, who I have suffered, prayed, and cared for, want me to die, hoping they will live happier lives after my death. 
Why would anyone want to stay in such a world? However, even when you die, you should not be less kind and loving to them. Continue to see them, be their friend, wish them well, and treat them gently. But this should not make you more unwilling to die. Your departure from them should be as easy as a quick, painless death, where the soul is quickly separated from the body. Nature had bound me to these people, but now she separates us. I am prepared to leave, as one would leave friends and family, without reluctance or force. This is also in accordance with nature. Whenever you see someone do something, ask yourself immediately, if possible, what is this person's goal in this action? But start this process with yourself first, and carefully examine your motives in everything you do. Remember, the thing that motivates a person and has the power to influence their emotions, pulling them in one direction or another, isn't an external thing. Rather, it's hidden within a person's beliefs and opinions. This is what truly defines a person. As for your body, which surrounds you like a vessel or case, and the many intricate tools it contains, don't let them trouble your thoughts. They are no more than a carpenter's axe, born with us and naturally attached to us. But without the internal cause that can move and control them, these parts are as useless to us as a shuttle is to a weaver, a pen to a writer, or a whip to a coachman. Summary of Chapter 10 The author discusses the idea of the universe as a single, interconnected whole in this chapter. He explores the concept of cosmic unity and how understanding this unity can bring clarity and purpose to life. He reminds us, all things are interwoven with one another, a sacred bond unites them, there is scarcely one thing that is isolated from all else. 